Hi, welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I run Podcast Engineering School, and I also produce podcasts for clients. And here you can see on the screen, this is Podcast Engineering School. This is a full online program that you can see. The next semester starts January 10th of 2023. And by the way, for those of you listening audio only, I'm actually doing this episode as a video as well. It'll be on the YouTube channel for Podcast Engineering School. And you can check out the Podcast Engineering Show, obviously, wherever you get your podcasts. For those of you watching the video, it's an audio podcast as well. I don't always do video, but sometimes I do. So, uh, And this is one of my daily goodie episodes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, nine or ten of my daily goodie blog posts. These are little blog posts I make. They're like little tips and tricks and little pieces of education for you. And I do them two to three times a week. You can also sign up for the email list for those if you'd like. And I also do some interviews. I, I mean, Barry Gary was, I think was the last episode, the previous episode from this. It was really amazing. Definitely check that out. And I have, you know, this is episode 242. I've done so many amazing interviews with amazing people. Actually, I meant to say amazing people. Like, I don't know if the interviews are amazing. <laughs> I think they might be, but anyway. Uh, I've talked to so many people about their equipment, their software, their workflow, all the tips and tricks they do, how they produce podcasts. So definitely check out some previous episodes, and you can sign up to uh, receive the Daily Goody emails as well if you want to. So, all right, well... I think I've said everything. Let's get right into the daily goodies. This is exciting. I got a bunch of really good ones to show you today. And let's start with this one. Putting the finishing touch on your podcast audio before publishing. So I refer to this as the mastering phase. And most podcasters and podcast producers don't even know what a mastering phase is. But it comes from the music industry where after a song is mixed and it sounds great, then they send it to a mastering engineer, and that's the engineer who does the final leveling. They also, again, put the finishing touch on it in terms of maybe a little more, little EQ, little compression, and there's a lot they can do, actually. There's too much to list here. But for podcasting, the mastering step consists of basically adjusting the overall Luff's loudness level, because you got to make sure that you're publishing your episodes at the proper loudness level, right? That's That makes a big difference for the listeners, right? So, and also, if you're crazy like me and others, uh, you can, you know, add a bit of EQ or compression or saturation. Uh, there's even some crazier stuff you can do, but but you don't have to do that crazy stuff. But the one thing you do to put the finishing touch on your episodes is to get them to the proper Luff's loudness level, which for mono episodes is minus 19 Luff's. And for stereo episodes, it's minus 16 Luff's. So, all right, well, that's a pretty simple one. Let's move on to the next one, which is how much would you like to earn producing podcasts? Yeah, so if you're, you know... For anyone, it, whether you're already producing podcasts or you're editing podcasts, whatever you're doing, how much would you like to earn? I think in general, it's it. people think that, oh, being a podcast editor, it's kind of like a part-time thing. You can earn some extra money. But let me be clear. There are plenty of full-time podcast producers like me who earn a great living just producing podcasts. And I'm not talking about having 100 clients or 150 clients. I'm talking about having five or six or seven clients, right? This is part of what I teach in my school. But so what I encourage you to do, if you really want to make a lot more money and make a living doing this, um, plan it out. And it starts with how much do you want to earn? Seriously, how much? 25K a year, 50K, 100K a year? And guess what? You can do it. You can plan it out and do it. Now, if you just want to work five or 10 or 20 hours a week, that's cool. If you want it to be a part-time thing, that's fine. Then that's good. But you're probably not going to make 100K a year, right? In that, in those cases, you might. It's possible. Uh, but whatever your plan uh, to roughly to roughly figure out your earning potential, I would say that around 75 
$100 or $125 an hour is the kind of rate you could arrange. Meaning, you might charge your clients with a per episode rate, but you can sort of figure out how long, and you do this beforehand, by the way, you figure out how long it's going to take you to produce one episode, and then you charge enough so that your hourly rate is $75 or $100 or $125 bucks per hour, right? And so you can sort of work the math backwards. Yeah, and so that's it. You can sort of figure out per hour or per how much you want to earn per year, and then you can also think about how much time you want to, how much time you're going to work each week, stuff like that. And then just do a bunch of math, take a pen and a pad, sit down on your couch for like an hour and just do math, do numbers. And so then you can, you know, really figure out how much you can, or how, you know, how to earn what you want to earn, right? I think this is really important. So don't sell yourself short. If you're a professional and you're producing professional sounding podcasts and you're offering a professional service, you should be making good money and, and there, and therefore you can't charge 50 bucks per episode, right? You can't, you got to charge like $500 an episode. And those clients are out there. Let me tell you that. So, all right, let's move on to the next daily goodie. Oh, this was an interview with Corey Marie Green that I did. I don't know if you've seen this one. She's the author of the podcaster's audio handbook. And we did, we did an episode. You can watch this video. The link will be in the show notes and in the description of the video. By the way, the links to all the daily goodies are, are in the show notes and uh, the video description. Okay, next daily goodie. Get fuller sound by manipulating harmonics. Yeah, so manipulating harmonics is what we call saturation. So saturation plugins can... I'm sorry, I'm scrolling. I, I don't need to scroll yet. Saturation plugins can increase the harmonics. And uh, it, by it, what it does is really kind of add some harmonic distortion, but it's very slight distortion. And it kind of makes the audio sound fuller and more professional. It makes it sound more old school, right? Like when we used to record on analog tape and there was that tape compression, right? And and we used to run the audio through physical gear hardware where they had, you know, transistors and tubes and things like that. It all added a little bit of saturation. So that's why saturation plugins are so popular in music these days. But But even in podcasting, you can use some saturation. Like the first plugin I list here, this is the, the Sheps Omni Channel from Waves. There's a saturation knob in there and it's cool. You can add like, you know, I think I add around eight or 10%. I put the knob at eight or 10 out of a hundred and it just adds a little bit of saturation. It just, it's subtle, but it really does make a difference. And these are the little differences that separate, you know, basically amateur audio from professional audio. Um, now are saturation plugins necessary? No, you don't need to use saturation. If you want to, you can, but I wouldn't say it's necessary. There's also the Black Box Analog Design HG2 from Plugin Alliance. That's a good one. Saturn 2 from FabFilter is also cool. True Iron from Kazrog. I love that one. That's that's transistor saturation. And then the BBN105 from Kit Plugins is a really cool channel strip. It's basically an EQ, but it does have a saturation button, which is really subtle and really nice. All right, well, that's some saturation plugins. You can click through those links too. Let's move on to the next daily goodie. And oh yeah, I did this last year on December 20th of 2021. This is a post titled, Do This Before New Year's Day. Okay, and this was sort of, this had nothing to do with audio production, by the way. This has to do with you setting some goals and achieving some goals. You know, we all want a better life and a better life starts with, saying, hey, this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do, and I'm going to make a plan to get there. And so I, I, you know, I'm not going to read all this right here, but check out this post because I talk about, uh, I suggest writing out your three-month goals in each and every one of these categories, family goals, material things, goals, financial goals, physical health goals. So it's basically goal setting, right? I'm not going to do a goal setting workshop here, but you, you understand the idea. And then write out your one-year goals, your three-year goals, your 10-year goals. Uh, write down which character traits you'd like to dispense with and which character traits you'd like to develop, right? 
and then write down every single thing in your life that you're grateful for. So these are, you know, this is, it's not quite New Year's resolutions. This is way deeper than New Year's resolutions. But if you haven't done this kind of thing in a while, or if you've never done it in your life, trust me, if you put aside a couple hours on a weekend and, you know, maybe with your spouse or your significant other, sit down and really just start dreaming and thinking about what you want, what you'd like to create in your life. I'm telling you, two hours will change your life. Promise you. Not even kidding, not exaggerating. And of course, I sincerely wish you all the best because as human beings, we we, we often forget how much we can achieve and, and we sell ourselves short. All right, next daily goodie. Yeah, for those of you watching the video, you can see the picture on the screen. Uh, I'm sorry if this picture causes trauma or if it triggers you. <laughs> All right, it's a picture of a Blue Yeti, and this is a daily goodie post that I wrote titled Urgent Advice for Any Podcaster Using a Blue Yeti. And the reason I wrote this was because the Blue Yeti, as I always say, it's a good microphone. It really is. The problem is about 90% of the people who buy this microphone, they use it the wrong way. There's a lot of mistakes you can make with the Blue Yeti that really... Uh, degrade the sound quality or cause blemishes in the sound or annoying things in the sound. So I made a list here of tips for how you can ensure sounding good with a Blue Yeti. So if you want to sound good with the Blue Yeti, here's the list of what you need to do. You need to speak into the microphone at the proper angle. Okay, the Blue Yeti is a side address microphone. You, you don't speak into the top of it. You speak into the side of it. And you can re research all these a little more, but this is this is the quick list, right? Make sure you use the correct polar pattern on the microphone. So the polar pattern is the pickup pattern. So you want you don't want to use omnidirectional or bidirectional if it's just one person. You want to use the cardioid pattern and then face the mic toward you properly. That will make sure that the microphone's picking up your voice and not picking up the noise from the whole room. Third one, speak as close to the mic as possible, but make sure that you use a pop filter or a windscreen or both. So yeah, um, Blue Yetis are condenser microphones. They're very sensitive. The diaphragm is very sensitive. If you if you do a plosive into that mic, it'll it'll create the most horrible thud you've ever heard in your life, as all condensers do. It's not specific to the Blue Yeti, but you, you want to have a windscreen or a pop filter there to stop that wind. And so to stop these plosives, it's really important, uh, especially if you're speaking, as I mentioned, close to the mic. And you want to speak close to the mic. I don't think I have that in this list, but you can't put a Blue Yeti three feet away from your mouth and expect to have good audio. You can't do it. That's why the whole design of the Blue Yeti, like if you look at the picture again, it sits on a desk. So what are you supposed to hunch over? to talk right into the microphone? No, they want this to be literally a foot and a half or two feet from your mouth, which causes horrendous audio because you're just, you're going to pick up some of your voice, but you're going to pick up a lot of reflections in the room and all the noise in the room as well. So of course this one's generic, but it also applies uh, even more to a blue Yeti. Make sure there's as little background noise as possible like fans, air conditioners, air vents, cars driving by, kids in the next room, or upstairs. You get, you get the idea. If your room is reverby, dampen the reflections using sound-absorbing furniture, rugs, foam acoustic panels. Yeah, because the Blue Yeti is very sensitive. It's going to pick up a lot. Uh, oh, and here's the, th yeah, the last one. Get the mic up off the desk and onto a boom arm to avoid capturing thuds and rumbles that are created on the table or the desk. I forgot about this. Because the Blue Yeti, normal, like the normal way to use it is it's sitting on a desk. If you literally type onto your keyboard with a Blue Yeti on your desk, every single keystroke creates a thud. It's like, dum, 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 dum. it's nasty. It's absolutely nasty. And so that's why it's good to get the Blue Yeti up off the desk so that if, if you do type or even touch the desk, you're not going to get these nasty thuds. So now, like I said, the Blue Yeti is a good mic if you use it properly. So you got to have, you got to do all these things right. And then the Blue Yeti is a good mic. So, all right, let's move on from the Blue Yeti. All right. The next one 
is, oh, it's my goodie bag episode number 229. Okay, we're not going to talk about that. Here's a question. Do you break down and put away your equipment after recording? Or do you just leave it set up? So most people, I think, and, and I do this, I have, a set, I have an equipment set up here at my desk, and I, I leave it set up. So if I want to record a podcast episode, I can just come to my desk and that's it. Just, you know, set up the recording and hit record and go. Now, some people, maybe if you're in a different space or, or if, you're, if you're using a space that other people use, maybe you sort of have to bring some equipment there and plug it in and set it up and then record. And then after you record, you have to unplug your equipment and take it away. That's okay, too. Either way is fine, but just um, just note that if you're going to be unplugging equipment and then and and then setting it up the next time and like every episode, if you're going to be plugging in and unplugging equipment, just be careful because a lot of the settings can change and you got to make sure you plug the cables in the right way. You know, obviously it's a lot easier if you can have your setup at your desk and you just don't touch it, right? So, so just be careful if you're moving stuff around or if you have to set up and break down. I cover most of my equipment with some like dust covers, like some little, like a plastic sheet that I put over it at night so it doesn't collect dust. All right, next, next one is, oh, this is the Amec 9099 plugin. Okay, you can see a picture of it on the screen. Anyway, it's a channel strip plugin from Plugin Alliance. I bought this on sale. I literally, I don't think I've used it. But it's, it's supposed to be really good. Now, listen, there are many really good channel strip plugins, okay? This is just one. So I'm not telling you to run out and buy this. <laughs> I'm just saying this is a pretty good one. It has a bunch of pretty cool features. Um, and I, in the blog post here, again, which I link to if you want to see all, any of these posts, you know, I go over what's in the plugin. But it's, it's, it's really a full-featured channel strip. It's got filters and EQ. Uh, I think it has a de-esser, compression. It it has a lot of stuff, and it's you know again based on uh, probably Amec hardware, which is really cool. So anyway, this is a cool channel strip plugin that does a lot, right? So yeah, all right. Next daily goodie. Please don't ever use your computer's built-in microphone for recording podcasts. I'm gonna repeat that, and I'm gonna plead with you. <laughs> Please don't ever use your computer's built-in microphone for recording podcasts. Now, obviously, most podcasters don't do this. Most podcasters, I mean, at minimum, they're going to use their earbuds. But probably most podcasters, they are going to buy an actual microphone, right? Like an ATR2100 or, you know, like a USB mic or... Oh, the Blue Yeti or something, um, or the, you know, the SM7B is now probably the most popular podcasting mic. But anyway, so I'm not talking, this post really isn't for podcasters. It's mostly for podcast producers who are going to be recording episodes with their clients who, who are the hosts and they have guests. So it's really the guests you know, but you can't control what a guest shows up with, right? You don't know if they have anything, you, you, you know, usually. You don't even know. I mean, usually you, you kind of think they have a computer. They're going to, you know, I'm, and I'm talking about remote guests, right? You can pretty much assume they have a computer, but, but that's not a guarantee, right? Some people join via their iPad, right? Stuff like that. But most people are going to join via a computer, and most people especially if they're on a Mac, they're going to plug in their earbuds, you know. And some people have actual microphones, which is great. But a lot of people, they don't even have earbuds or they don't know anything. Usually it's older folks. They don't know anything and they just connect. They don't have a mic. They don't have their earbuds. They don't have anything. And so they sometimes they have to talk into their laptop. So if you ever connect with a guest and they're talking into their laptop microphone, Definitely, you want to ask them if they have anything else, if they have a real microphone. If not, do you have earbuds? You know, you, you know what? You know what's way better than talking into a computer's the built in microphone is having the guest join from their phone and at least hold the phone up to their face and talk right into their phone. That's better, uh, usually, 
than talking into a computer's built-in microphone. And you got to be you got to be aware. If you ever hear someone say, "Oh, I t- I use my computer mic and it sounds it sounds fine." Like look, maybe some of them don't sound 100% horrendous, but they're all pretty bad. And so if someone ever says that, like, "Oh no, I just use my built-in computer microphone." Like, yeah. I mean, again, sometimes it's not terrible, but mm, it's rough. All right, enough on that one. Let's move to the next one which is about Riverside. Riverside is the platform, one of the one of the best platforms where you can record remote guests and everything, and it actually records each participant locally. And then you download all those files later, which is great. So Riverside has a noise suppression feature. And this is, you know, a lot of these companies have it, Zencaster, Squadcast. What it does is it's, it removes background noises such as fans or heaters or other ambient sounds. When they say noise suppression, they're not talking about like, you know, the dog that's barking or someone clicking a pen. It, it doesn't, doesn't affect those noises. It's just background noises, like room noise uh, and, and fans and, you know, air vents, shh, stuff like that. And, you know, this is a good feature for people who have a lot of background noise. But I would say before you use the noise suppression feature, I would, if someone has like an air conditioner on that's really loud, I would ask them to turn it off. I mean, this is just fundamental audio recording wisdom. Like you you don't want any extra noise. You just don't want it. And here's the reason. Some people think like, for instance, Riverside's noise suppression feature that we're talking about and whatever noise reduction these other platforms have it works, but it it's not perfect. It does damage the sound. It degrades the sound significantly. That's the audio truth. So it's not magic. It's not like, oh, I can run seven air conditioners and have a truck, uh, you know, have a car idling three feet from my head. And oh, I could just turn on noise suppression and everything's gone. It doesn't work like that. It's not magic. They do help get rid of the noise but they do degrade the quality of the audio significantly, okay? Now, if you have no other choice, then yeah, you got to use it. If you have a guest that shows up and it's noisy, okay, then you can use it. I'm not saying you can never use it. What I'm saying is don't think it's a, 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 the solution for every problem. No, solve the problem first before you turn on the, the noise suppression. So, in general, I would only record using noise this noise suppression or noise reduction if both of these things are true. I won't have the ability in post-production to do any noise reduction, right? Let me comment on that. If you're going to be doing post-production and you have some noise reduction, like for instance, if you use Isotope RX, which has great noise reduction, I would use it in RX in post-production rather than use it during recording in Riverside or Squadcast or anything. So that's number one. And the second thing is I would only use it if the participant has significant background noise, which they cannot turn off or remove before we start recording. So again, and I think I spoke about that enough. So, all right, well, it's a good feature. I'm glad they have it. Obviously they need to have it, but again, don't rely on it. That's not the right way to, to fix the audio. The right way is to fix it before you press record. Okay. All right. And the last one we're going to cover today is actually a video I made on the CLA 2A compressor limiter plugin from Waves. This is a really cool, simple plugin. It's a simple compressor. It's basically two knobs and it's an optical compressor, which sounds very good on voices and vocals. And it's, it's really simple to use, and it's modeled off of the famous LA-2A compressor limiter. So this is a really good one. I made a video talking about it. It's a simple video. Again, it's two knobs, but all right. And like I said, I'm going to link to every single daily goodie that I discussed. I'm going to link to in the show notes or the video description. So that's it for this uh, episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you're and If you're on YouTube or watching this on video... Definitely consider giving a like and a subscribe. And if you're listening to the audio only um, and you haven't checked out 
the YouTube channel for Podcast Engineering School. Check it out. I'm posting short little videos every day. It's almost like a little daily goodie every day on YouTube. So definitely Podcast Engineering School on YouTube. And you could subscribe there and ping, you know, message me there and all that and comment and make fun of me and all that stuff. So that's it. Um, thanks, everybody. Don't forget the next semester of Podcast Engineering School starts. When does it start? January 10th, 2023. Yeah. So and you can enroll now or anytime before January 10th. So, all right, we'll leave it there. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Be good.